Hello everyone and welcome to Word of Mouth. For those of you who do not know, Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. My name is Andrew Foster and today uh, I and another guest reader are going to be presenting two stories for you in honor of Black History Month. We're going to be reading um, Everyday Use and To Hell With Dying, both by Alice Walker. If you enjoyed today's stories and would like to hear more uh, in the next program, uh, Word of Mouth is broadcast on the first and third Thursday of most month, this month being an exception because we had some uh, issues come up, uh, at 12.10 p.m. Central Time. We can watch it live through the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library's Facebook page. That's at MCCPL Morgan. Or you can watch it later that day on the Montgomery City County Public Library's YouTube page. That's all the announcements. Our first story, um, Everyday Use, is going to be read by one of our uh, Reference librarians, one of our, uh, the lady who runs our computer lab, Miss LaRuth Martin. Miss LaRuth? Everyday Youth by Alice Walker. I will wait for her in the yard that Maggie and my I made so clean and wavy yesterday afternoon. A yard like this is more comfortable than most people know. It is not just a yard. It is like an, ex an extended living room. When the hard clay is swept clean as a floor and the fine sand around the edges lined with tiny irregular grooves, Anyone can come and sit and look up into the elm tree and wait for the breezes that never come inside the house. Maggie will be nervous until after her sister goes. She will stand hopelessly in corners, homely and ashamed of the burn scars down her arms and legs, eyeing her sister with a mixture of envy and all. She thinks her sister has held life always in the palm of one hand and that no is a word the world never learned to say to her. You've no doubt seen those TV shows where the child who has made it is confronted by as a surprise by her own mother and father tottering in weakly from backstage. A pleasant surprise, of course. What would they do if parent and child came on the show only to curse out and insult each other? On TV, mother and child embrace and smile into each other f other's faces. Sometimes the mother and father weep. The child wraps them in her arms and leans across the table to tell how she would not have made it without their help. I have seen these programs. Sometimes I dream a dream in which Dee and I are suddenly brought together on a TV program of this sort. Out of a dark and soft-seated limousine, I am ushered into a bright room filled with many people. There I meet a smiling, gray, sporty man like Johnny Carson, who shakes my hand and tells me what a fine girl I have. Then we are on the stage and Dee is embracing me with tears in her eyes. She pins on my dress a large orchid even though she has told me once that she thinks orchids are tacky flowers. In real life, I am a large, big-boned woman with rough man-working hands. In the winter, I wear flannel nightgowns to bed and overalls during the day. I can kill and clean a hog as well as any man. My fat keeps me hot in zero weather. I can work outside all day breaking ice to get water for washing. I can eat pork liver 
cooked over the open fire minutes after it comes steaming from the hog. One winter, I knocked a bull calf straight in the brain between the eyes with a sledgehammer and had the meat hung up to chill before nightfall. But of course, all this does not show on television. I am the way my daughter would want me to be. A hundred pounds lighter, my skin like an uncooked barley pancake. My hair glistens in the hot, bright lights. Johnny Carson has much to do to keep up with my quick tongue and my quick wit. But that is a mistake. I know even before I wake up, whoever knew a Johnson with a quick tongue? Who can even imagine me looking a strange white man in the eye? It seems to me I have talked to them always with one foot raised in flight, with my head fumed in whichever way is farthest from them. Dido, she would always look anyone in the eye. Hesitation was no part of her nature. How do I look, Mama? Maggie says, showing just enough of her thin body enveloped in pink skirt and red blouse for me to know she's there, almost hidden by the door. Come out into the yard, I say. Have you ever seen a lame animal, perhaps a dog, run over by some careless person rich enough to own a car, sidle up to someone who is ignorant enough to be kind to him? That is the way my Maggie walks. She has been like this, chin on chest, eyes on ground, feet in shuffle, ever since the fire that burned the other house to the ground. Dee is lighter than Maggie, with nicer hair and a fuller figure. She's a woman now, though sometimes I forget. How long was it that the other house burned? Ten, twelve years? Sometimes I could still hear the flames and feel Maggie's arms sticking to me, her hair smoking and her dress falling off her in little black papery flakes. Her eyes seemed stretched open, blazed open by the flames reflected in them. And D, I see her standing off under the sweet gum tree she used to dig gum out of. A look of concentration on her face as she watched the last dingy gray board of the house fall in toward the red hot brick chimney. Why don't you do a dance around the ashes? I'd wanted to ask her that. She hated that house so much. I used to think she hated Maggie too. But that was before we raised money, the church and me, to send her to Augusta to school. She used to read to us without pity, forcing words, lies, other folks' habits, whole lives upon us too, sitting trapped and ignorant under her, underneath her voice. She washed us in a river of make-believe, burned us with a lot of knowledge we didn't necessarily need to know, pressed us to her with the serious way she read to shove us away like dimwits, at just the moment we seemed about to understand. Dee wanted nice things, a yellow orange dress to wear to her graduation from high school, black pumps to match a green suit she'd made from an old suit somebody gave me. She was determined to stare down any disaster in her efforts. Her eyelids would not flicker for minutes at a time, Often, I fought off the temptation to shake her. At 16, she had a style of her own, and she knew what style was. I never had an education myself. After second grade, the school was closed down. 
Don't ask me why. In 1927, colored asked fewer questions than they do now. Sometimes Maggie reads to me. She stumbles along good-naturedly, but can't see well. She knows she is not bright. She looks, she like good looks and money, quickness passes her by. She will marry John Thomas, who has mossy teeth in an earnest face. And then I'll be free to sit here and guess just sing church songs to myself, although I'm, I was never a good singer. Never could carry a tune. I was always better at a man's job. I used to love to milk till I was hooked in the side in 49. Cows are soothing and slow and don't bother you unless you try to milk them the wrong way. I have deliberately turned my back on the house. It is three rooms, just like the one that burned, except the roof is tin. They don't make shingle roofs anymore. There are no real windows, just some holes cut in the sides, like the portholes in a ship, but not round and not square, with raw hide holding the shutters up on the outside. This house is in a pasture too, like the other one. No doubt when Dee sees it, she will want to tear it down. She wrote me once that no matter where we choose to live, she would manage to come see us. But she never will bring her friends. Maggie and I thought about it, and Maggie asked me, Mama, when did Dee ever have any friends? She had a few. Some boys in pink shirts hanging about on wash day after school. Nervous girls who never laughed. Impressed with her, they worshipped the well-turned phrase, the cute shape, the scalding humor that erupted like bubbles in lie. She read to them. When she was courting Jimmy T, she didn't have much time to pay to us but turned all her fault-finding power on him. He flew to marry a cheap city girl from a family of ignorant, flashy people. She hardly had time to recompose herself. When she comes, I will meet... Oh, but there they are. Maggie attempts to make a dash for the house in her shuffling way, but I stay her with my hand. Come back here, I say, and she stops and tries to dig a well in the sand with her toe. It is hard to see them clearly through the strong sun, but even the first glimpse of leg out of the car tells me it is D. Her feet were always neat looking, as if God himself had shaped them with a certain style. From the other side of the car comes a short, stocky man. Hair is all over his head, a foot long, and hanging from his chin like a kinky mule tail. I hear Maggie suck in her breath, ugh, is what it sounds like. Like when you see the wriggling end of a snake just in front of your foot on the road. Ugh. D next. A dress down to the ground in this hot weather. A dress so loud it hurts my eyes. There are yellows and oranges enough to throw back the light of the sun. I feel my whole face warming from the heat waves it throws out. Gold earrings, too, hanging down to her shoulders. Bracelets dangling and making noises when she moves her arm up to shake the folds of the dress out of her armpits. The dress is loose and flows, and as she walks closer, I like it. I hear Maggie go, ugh, again. It is her sister's hair. It stands straight up like the wool on a sheep. It is black as night, and around the edges are two long pigtails 
that rope about like small lizards disappearing behind her ears. Wazuzatinio, she says, coming on in that gliding way the dress makes her move. The short, stocky fellow with the hair to his navel is all grinning, and he follows up with Asama Lakum, my mother and sister. He moves to hug Maggie, but she falls back right up against the back of my chair. I feel her trembling there, and when I look up, I see the perspiration falling off her chin. Don't get up, says Dee. Since I am stout, it takes something of a push. You can see me trying to move, trying to move a second or two before I make it. She turns, showing white heels through her sandals, and goes back to the car. Out she peeks next with a Polaroid. She stoops down quickly and snaps off picture after picture of me sitting there in front of the house with Maggie cowering behind me. She never takes a shot without making sure the house is included. When a cow comes nibbling around the edge of the yard, she snaps it and me and Maggie and the house. Then she puts the Polaroid in the back seat of the car and comes up and kisses me on the forehead. Meanwhile, Asalaam Alaikum is going through motions with Maggie's hand. Maggie's hand is as limp as a fish and probably as cold despite the sweat. And she keeps trying to pull it back. It looks like Asalaam Alaikum wants to shake hands, but wants to do it fancy. Or maybe he don't know how people shake hands. Anyhow, he soon gives up on Maggie. Well, I say, D. No, Mama, she says, not D. Wangirio la Winica Kimanjo. What happened to D? I wanted to know. She's dead, Wangirio said. I couldn't bear it any longer, being named after the people who oppressed me. You know as well as me you were named after your Aunt Dicey, I said. Dicey is my sister. She named Dee. We called her Big D after Dee was born. But who was she named after, asked Wajiria. I guess after Grandma Dee, I said. And who was she named after, asked Wajiria. Her mother, I said and saw Wajirio was getting tired. That's about as far back as I can trace it, I said, though, in fact, I probably could have carried it back beyond the Civil War through the branches. Well, said Awesome Lama Lakum, there you are. Oh, I heard Maggie say. There I was not, I said before Dicey cropped up in our family, so why should I trace it that far back? He just stood there grinning, looking down on me like somebody inspecting a Model A car. Every once in a while, he and Wajirio sent eye signals over my head. How do you pronounce this name, I asked. You don't have to call me by it if you don't want to, said Wajirio. Why shouldn't I, I asked. If that's what you want us to call you, we'll call you. I know it might sound awkward at first, said Wajirio. I'll get used to it, I said. Ream it out again. Well, soon we got the name out, the, out of the way. Asalaam Alaikum had a name twice as long and three times as hard. After I ripped over it two or three times, he told me just to call him Akeem a barber. I wanted to ask him, was he a barber? But I didn't really think he was, so I didn't ask. You must belong to those beef cattle peoples down the road, I said. 
they said assalamu alaikum when they meet you too, but they didn't shake hands. Always too busy feeding the cattle, fixing the fences, putting up salt lick shelters, throwing down hay. When the white folks poisoned some of the herd, the men stayed up all night with rifles in their hands. I walked a mile and a half just to see that sight. Hakima Barber said, I accept some of their doctrines, but farming and raising cattle is not my style. They didn't tell me, and I didn't ask, whether Wajurio D. had really gone and married him. We sat down to eat, and right away he said he didn't eat collards, and pork was unclean. Wajurio, though, went on through the chitlins and cornbread, the greens, and everything else. She talked a blue streak over the sweet potatoes. Everything delighted her. Even the fact that we still used the benches her dad had made for the table when we couldn't afford to buy chairs. Oh, mama, she cried, then turned to Hakima Barber. I never knew how lovely these benches are. You can feel the rump prints, she said, running her hands underneath her and along the bench. Then she gave a sigh and her hand closed over Grandma Dee's butter dish. That's it, she said. I knew there was something I wanted to ask you if I could have. She jumped up from the table and went over in the corner where the churn stood. The milk in it clabbered by now. She looked at the churn and looked at it. This churn top is what I need, she said. Didn't Uncle Buddy whittle it out of a tree you all used to have? Yes, I said. Uh-huh, she said happily, and I want the dasher, too. Uncle Buddy whittle that, too, asked the barb. D, I mean, Wajirio looked up at me. Aunt Dee's first husband whittled the dash, said Maggie, so low you, could, you almost couldn't hear her. His name was Henry, but they called him Stash. <laughs> Maggie's brain is like an elephant's, what Jurio said, laughing. I can use the churn top as a centerpiece for the alcove table, she said, sliding a plate over the churn, and I think I'll do something artistic with the dasher. When she finished wrapping the dasher, the handle stuck out. I took it for a moment in my hands. You didn't even have to look close to see where hands pushing the dasher up and down to make butter had left a kind of sink in the wood. In fact, there were a lot of small sinks. You could see where thumbs and fingers had sunk into the wood. It was a beautiful light yellow wood from a tree that grew in the yard where Big D and Stash had lived. After dinner, D, I mean Wajirio, went to the trunk at the foot of my bed and started rifling through it. Maggie hung back in the kitchen over the dishpan. Out came Wajirio with two quilts. They had been pieced by Grandma D, and then Big D and me had hung them on the quilt frames on the front porch and quilted them. One was in the long star pattern. The other was walk around the mountain. In both of them were scraps of dresses Grandma D had worn 50 and more years ago. Bits and pieces of Grandpa Gerald's paisley shirts and one teeny faded blue piece about the size of a penny matchbox. That was from great Grandpa Ezra's uniform that he wore in the Civil War. Mama, Wajirio said as sweet as a bird, can I have these old quilts? I heard something fall in the kitchen and a minute later the kitchen door slammed. 
don't you take one or two of the others, I asked. These old things was just done by me and Big D from some tops your grandma pieced before she died. No, said Wajirio. I don't want those. They are stitched around the borders by machine. That'll make them last better, I said. That's not the point, said Wajirio. These are all pieces of dresses Grandma used to wear. She did all the stitching by hand. Imagine! She held the quilt securely in her arms, stroking them. Some of the pieces, like those lapidar ones, come from old clothes her mother handed down to her, I said, moving up to touch the quilts. D, I mean Wajirio, moved back just enough that I couldn't reach the quilts. <laughs> they already belonged to her. Imagine, she breathed again, clutching them closely to her bosom. The truth is, I said, I promised to give them quilts to Maggie for when she marries John Thomas. She gasped like a bee had stung her. Maggie can't appreciate these quilts, she said. She'll probably be backward enough to put them to everyday use. I reckon she would, I said. God knows I've been saving them for long enough with nobody using them. I hope she will. I didn't want to bring up how I had offered D, I mean Wajirio, a quilt when she went away to college. Then... She had told they were old-fashioned and out of style. But they're priceless, she was saying now, furiously, for she has a temper. Maggie will put them on the bed, and in five years they'll be in rags. Less than that. She can always make some more, I said. Maggie knows how to quilt. D, I mean Wajirio, looked at me with hatred. You just will not understand. The point is these quilts, these quilts. Well, I said stumped, what would you do with them? Hang them, she said, as if that was the only thing you could do with quilts. Maggie by now was standing in the door. I could almost hear the sound of her feet as they scraped over each other. She can have them, Mama, she said, like somebody used to never winning anything or having anything reserved for her. I can remember Grandma D without the quilts. I looked at her hard. She had filled her bottom lip with checkerberry snuff and gave her face a kind of dopey hangdog look. It was Grandma D and Big D who taught her how to quilt. She stood there with her scarred hands hidden in the folds of her skirt. She looked at her sister with something like fear, but she wasn't mad at her. This was Maggie's portion. This was the way she knew God to work. When I looked at her like that, something hit me in the top of my head and ran down to the soles of my feet. Just like when I'm in church and the Spirit of God touches me and I get happy and shout. I did something I've never done before, hugged Maggie to me, then dragged her on into the room, snatched the quilts out of Miss Wajirio's hands, and dumped them in Maggie's lap. Maggie just sat there on my bed with her mouth open. Take one or two of the others, I said to Dee. But she turned without a word and went out to Hakeem a barber. You just don't understand, she said as Maggie and I came out to the car. What don't I understand? I wanted to know. Your heritage, she said, 
And then she turned to Maggie, kissed her, and said, You ought to try to make something of yourself too, Maggie. It's really a new day for us. But from the way you and Mama still live, you'd never know it. She put on some sunglasses that hid everything above the tip of her nose and chin. <laughs> Maggie smiled, maybe at the glasses, but a real smile, not scared. After we washed the dust settle from the car, I asked Maggie to bring me a dip of snuff. And then the two of us sat there just enjoying until it was time to go in the house and go to bed. To Hell with Dying by Alice Walker. To hell with dying, my father would say. These children want Mr. Sweet. Mr. Sweet was a diabetic and an alcoholic and a guitar player and lived down the road from us in a neglected cotton farm. My older brothers and sisters got the most benefit from Mr. Sweet, for when they were growing up, he had quite a few years ahead of him and so was capable of being called back from the brink of death any number of times. Whenever the voice of my father reached him as he lay expiring... To hell with dying, man, my father would say, pushing the wife away from the bedside in tears, although she knew the death was not necessarily the last one, unless Mr. Sweet really wanted it to be. These children want Mr. Sweet. And they did want him, for at a signal from father, they would come crowding around the bed and throw themselves on the covers, and whoever was the smallest at the time would kiss him all over his wrinkled brown face and tickle him so that he would laugh all down in his stomach. And his mustache, which was long and sort of scraggly, would shake like Spanish moss and was also that color. Mr. Sweet had been ambitious as a boy, wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer or a sailor, only to find that black men fare better if they are not. Since he could become none of these things, he turned to fishing as his only earnest career and playing the guitar as his only claim to doing anything extraordinarily well. His son, the only one that he and his wife Miss Mary had, was shiftless as the day is long, and spent money as if he were trying to see the bottom of the mint, which Mr. Sweet would tell him was the clean brown palm of his hand. Miss Mary loved her baby, however, and worked hard to get him the little necessities of life, which turned out mostly to be women. Mr. Sweet was a tall, thinnish man with a thick, kinky hair going dead white. He was dark brown, his eyes were squinty and sort of bluish, and he chewed brown mule tobacco. He was constantly on the verge of being blind drunk, for he brewed his own liquor and was not in the least a stingy sort of man, and was always very melancholy and sad, though frequently when he was feeling good, he danced around the yard with us, usually keeling over just as my mother came to see what the commotion was. Toward all of us children, he was very kind, and he had the grace to be shy with us, which is unusual in grown-ups. He had great respect for my mother, for she had never held his drunkenness against him, and would let us play with him even when he was about to fall in the fireplace from drink. Although Mr. Sweet would sometimes lose complete or near-complete control of his head and neck, so that he would loll about in his chair. His mind remained strangely acute, and his speech not too affected. His ability to be drunk and sober at the same time made him an ideal playmate, for he was as weak as we were, and we could usually best him in wrestling, all while keeping a fairly coherent conversation going. We never felt anything about Mr. Sweet's age when we played with him. We loved his wrinkles and would draw some on our brows to be like him and his white hair was my special treasure, and he knew it and would never come to visit us just after he had been to the barber shop. Once he came to our house for something, probably to see my father about fertilizer for his crops, because although he never paid the slightest attention to his crops, he liked to know what things would best be used on them if he ever did. Anyhow, he had not come with his hair since he had just had it shaved off at the barber shop. He wore a huge straw hat to keep off the sun and also to keep his head away from me, 
but as soon as I saw him, I ran up and demanded that he take me up and kiss me with his funny beard, which smelled so strongly of tobacco. Looking forward to burying my small fingers into his woolly hair, I threw away his hat, only to find that he had done something to his hair, and it was no longer there. I let out a squall which made my mother think that Mr. Sweet had finally dropped me in the well, or something, and from that day on I have been wary of men with hats. However, not long after, Mr. Sweet showed up with his hair grown out and just as white and kinky and impenetrable as it ever was. Mr. Sweet used to call me his princess, and I believed it. He made me feel pretty at five and six, and simply outrageously devastating at the blazing age of eight and a half. When he came to our house with his guitar, the whole family would stop whatever they were doing to sit around him and listen to him play. He liked to play Sweet George Brown, and that was what he called me sometimes. And also he liked to play Caledonia and all sorts of sweet, sad, wonderful songs, which he sometimes made up. It was from one of these songs that I heard that he had to marry Miss Mary, when he had in fact loved somebody else, now living in Chicago, or destroy Michigan. He was not sure that Joe Lee, her baby, was also his baby. Sometimes he would cry, and that was an indication that he was about to die again. And so we would all get prepared, for we were sure to be called upon. I was seven the first time I remember actually participating in one of Mr. Sweet's revivals. My parents told me I had participated before. I had been the one chosen to kiss him and tickle him long before I knew the right of Mr. Sweet's rehabilitation. He had come to our house, it was a few years after his wife's death, and was very, very sad, and also, typically, very drunk. He sat on the floor next to me and my older brother, the rest of the children were grown up and lived elsewhere, and began to play his guitar and cry. I held his woolly head in my arms, and wished I could have been old enough to have been the woman he loved so much, and that I had not been lost years and years ago. When he was leaving, my mother said to us that we'd better sleep light that night, for we probably would have to go over to Mr. Sweet's before daylight. And we did. For soon after we had gone to bed, one of the neighbors knocked on our door and called my father and said that Mr. Sweet was sinking fast, and if he wanted to get in a word before the crossover, he'd better shake a leg and get over to Mr. Sweet's house. All the neighbors knew to come to our house if something was wrong with Mr. Sweet but they did not know how we always managed to make him well, or at least stop him from dying, when he was so often near death. As soon as we heard the cry, we got up, my brother and I, and my mother and father, and put on our clothes. We hurried out to the house and down the road, for we were always afraid that we might someday be too late, and Mr. Sweet would get tired of dallying. When we got to the house, a very poor shack, really, we found the front room full of neighbors, and someone met us at the door and said it was all very sad that old Mr. Sweet Little, for Little was his family name, although we mostly ignored it, was about to kick the bucket. My parents were advised not to take my brother and me into the death room, seeing we were so young and all, but we were so much more accustomed to the death room than he that we ignored him and dashed in without giving his warnings a second thought. I was almost in tears, for these deaths upset me fearfully, and the thought of how much depended on me and my brother, who was such a ham most of the time, made me very nervous. The doctor was bending over the bed and turned back to tell us for at least the tenth time in the history of my family that, alas, old Mr. Sweet Little was dying, and that the children had best not see the face of implacable death. I did not know what implacable was, but whatever it was, Mr. Sweet was not. My father pushed him rather abruptly out of the way, saying, as he always did, and very loudly, for he was saying it to Mr. Sweet, To hell with dying, man! These children want Mr. Sweet! Which was my cue to throw myself upon the bed and kiss Mr. Sweet all around the whiskers and under the eyes and around the collar of his nightshirt, which he smelled so strongly of all sorts of things mostly liniment. He was very good at bringing him around, for as soon as I saw that he was struggling to open his eyes, I knew he was going to be all right, and so I could finish my revival sure that I had surely won. Once, though, I got a tremendous scare, for he could not open his eyes, and later I learned that he had had a stroke, 
and that one side of his face was stiff and hard to get into motion. When he began to smile, I would tickle him in earnest because I was sure that nothing would get in the way of his laughter. Although once he began to cough so hard that he almost threw me off his stomach. But that was when I was very small, little more than a baby, and my bushy hair had gotten into his nose. When we were sure he would listen to us, he would ask us to play. And when he was coming to see us again, and when we could play his guitar, which was more than likely would be leaning against the bed. His eyes would get all misty, and he would sometimes cry out loud, but we never let it embarrass us, for he knew that we loved him, and we just sometimes cried too for no reason. My parents would leave the room to just the three of us. Mr. Sweet, by that time, would be propped up in bed with a number of pillows behind his head, and me sitting and lying on his shoulder and along his chest. Even when he had trouble breathing, he would not ask me to get down. Looking into my eyes... He would shake his white head and run a scratchy old finger all along my hairline, which was rather low down, nearly to my eyebrows, and made some people say I looked like a baby monkey. My brother was very generous in all this. He let me do all the revivaling. He had done it for years before I was born, and so was glad to be able to pass it on to someone new. What he would do while I talked to Mr. Sweet was pretend to play the guitar. In fact, pretend that he was a young version of Mr. Sweet and it always made Mr. Sweet glad to think that someone wanted to be like him. Of course, we did not know this then. We played the thing by ear, and whatever he seemed to like, we did. We were desperately afraid that he was just going to take off one day and leave us. It did not occur to us that we were doing anything special. We had not learned that death was final when it did come. We thought nothing of triumphing over it so many times, and in fact, became a trite contemptuous of people who let themselves be carried away. It did not occur to us that if our father had been dying, we could not have stopped it, and that Mr. Sweet was the only person over whom we had power. When Mr. Sweet was in his 80s, I was studying in the university many miles from home. I saw him whenever I went home, but he was never on the verge of dying that I could tell and I began to feel that my anxiety for his health and psychological well-being was unnecessary. By this time, he not only had a mustache, but a long, flowing, snow-white beard, which I loved and combed and braided for hours. He was very peaceful, fragile, gentle, and the only jarring note about him was his old steel guitar, which he still played in the old, sad, sweet down-home blues way. On Mr. Sweet's 90th birthday, I was finishing my doctorate in Massachusetts and had been making arrangements to go home for several weeks' rest. That morning, I got a telegram telling me that Mr. Sweet was dying again. And could I please drop by? Of course I could. My dissertation could wait, and my teachers would understand when I explained to them when I got back. I ran to the phone called the airport, and within four hours I was speeding along the dusty road to Mr. Sweet's. The house was more dilapidated than when I last was there, barely a shack, but it was overgrown with yellow roses which my family had planted there years ago. The air was heavy and sweet and very peaceful. I felt strange walking through the gate and up the rickety old steps, but the strangeness left me as I caught sight of the long white beard I loved so well flowing down the thin body with the overly familiar coverlet. Mr. Sweet. His eyes were closed tight and his hands crossed over his stomach were thin and delicate, no longer scratchy. I remembered how always before I had run and jumped on him just anywhere. Now I knew he would not be able to support my weight. I looked around at my parents and was surprised to see that my father and mother also looked old and frail. My father, his own hair very gray, leaned over the quietly sleeping old man, who incidentally smelled still of wine and tobacco and said, as he had done so many times, To hell with dying, man. My daughter is home to see Mr. Sweet. My brother had not been able to come as he was in the war in Asia. I bent down and gently stroked the closed eyes, and gradually they began to open. The closed, wine-stained lips twitched a little and then parted in a warm, slightly embarrassed smile. Mr. Sweet could see me and recognized me, 
and his eyes looked very spry and twinkly for a moment. I put my head down on the pillow next to his, and we just looked at each other for a long time. Then he began to trace my peculiar hairline with a thin, smooth finger. I closed my eyes when his finger halted above my ear. He used to rejoice at the dirt in my ears when I was little. His hand stayed cupped around my cheek. When I opened my eyes, sure that I had reached him in time, his were closed. Even at 24, how could I believe that I had failed, that Mr. Sweet was really gone? He had never gone before, but when I looked at my parents, I saw that they were holding back tears. They had loved him dearly. He was like a piece of rare and delicate china which was always being saved from breaking, and which finally fell. I looked long at the old face, the wrinkled forehead, the red lips, and the hands that still reached out to me. Soon I felt my father pushing something cool into my hands. It was Mr. Sweet's guitar. He had asked them months before to give it to me. He had known that even as I came next time, he would not be able to respond in the old way. He did not want me to feel that my trip had been for nothing. The old guitar. I plucked the strings, hummed Sweet Georgia Brown. The magic of Mr. Sweet lingered still in the cool, still box. Though the window I could catch the fragrant, delicate scent of tender yellow roses. The man on the high, old-fashioned bed with the quilt coverlet and the flowing white beard had been my first love. I hope that you've enjoyed our stories today uh, as much as we've enjoyed presenting them to you. Uh, we will be back actually next Thursday. Uh, I believe that'll be on March the 4th for our next word of mouth. I hope you'll join us then. Have a wonderful day.